This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Also, make sure to check out and subscribe to our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, available only on YouTube. Um, so I think it's, um, we have to climb uh, down from the ivory tower of academics into the real ugly world of kidney transplantation. So um, I want to declare that I'm the site principal investigator for a carbon monoxide study which has been completed and for a P53 silencing RNA, RNA study which is ongoing. So as you've heard from Rio, there's lots of science, but there's basically no therapeutics. So this is the real problem. And I think I'm gonna try to share with you what are some of the challenges are um, you know, in translating this bed to bed, bench to bedside problem. We know that many, many, many professorships are based on ischemia reperfusion injury. Um, there's tremendous amount of research and money, but just nothing really penetrates the clinic. So I think that there's problems with the models that are used, the endpoint selection, and also some logistical and ethical uh, issues, uh, particularly related to donor intervention. So I'm going to dive right in just by talking about three trials. There are more trials than this, but not that many more. And these are the three that we've done at UCSF, so we can sort of give you a bird's eye view. So carbon monoxide, you know, first of all, it's not easy to convince patients to inhale a bunch of carbon monoxide. Every winter, you know, you have all these stories, you have companies advertising for carbon monoxide detectors in your home because we're all gonna die of carbon monoxide poisoning. Um, but this is the challenge that we face and we, we rose up to it because we probably have given more humans carbon monoxide than any transplant center in the country. So this is a single blind placebo-controlled safety and tolerability. So again, this is very early stuff, safety and tolerability. We're not talking about efficacy. Um, I'm gonna just, you know, you, I've listed some of the mechanisms, but we're not gonna get into that because that was Rio's job, which he did very, very well. So how do we know that this might even work? Well, they used a pig allo transplantation model that had 60 minutes of warm ischemia achieved by cross clamping above and below the kidney, um, as well as 24 hours of cold storage in University of Wisconsin solution. They then did a transplant taking out the native kidneys of the transplant recipient. They then delivered carbon monoxide during this transplant operation through the ventilator, and they gave the pigs uh, immunosuppression with tacrolimus. So what did it do? It accelerated renal recovery from ischemia reperfusion injury. You can see that the BUN and the creatinine curves, uh, the lower curve, there's quicker recovery, uh, a quicker reduction of BUN and creatinine in the first three to seven days after transplantation. Well, how much carbon monoxide were these pigs getting? They breathed it for one hour, and the peak doses are 10% uh, carboxyhemoglobin. So if you're a garage mechanic and you're breathing fumes or you're standing in the treat as a street as a police cop, you probably have 5% carboxyhemoglobin in your blood. 10% in the trials that we did, you know, where we administered um, uh, neurocognitive testing, there was a a computer test where they gave you 20 pictures and they said which pictures are like the ones you've seen before and they tested your memory and cognitive, it had absolutely no impact. So this level of carbon monoxide to a rough approximation is quote unquote biologically safe because you're only exposed to the carbon monoxide for one hour, it builds up to a peak and then it gets exhaled out and therefore it's not prolonged exposure like being locked up in a garage with a car and you know trying to commit suicide. 
So no, we're not trying to actually harm people. Now, carbon monoxide improved the histology and reduced apoptosis in these pig kidneys. You see the untreated, um, you know, unmanipulated kidneys, uh, kidney uh, pigs who just breathe quote unquote air, which is 40% uh, FiO2, and pigs who breathe 40% FiO2 along with carbon monoxide. So the tunnel staining has decreased apoptosis, which you can see in the treated animals. Carbon monoxide increased proliferation markers, which is the upper uh, panel, and decreased markers of inflammation, which is the lower panel. You can see a lot uh, less red in the carbon monoxide treated animals than in those that were not treated. And then finally, there were pretty profound changes in gene expression that you can see from this heat map. The naive animals are mostly blue in terms of their gene expression. The untreated animals are mostly red. And you can see that the carbon monoxide treatment modulated the gene expression based on these microarrays. And these were confirmed by PCR. And some of these genes, um, uh, Rio mentioned osteopontin, HSP90, and retinal binding protein are sort of tissue repair and regeneration, and you can see that they were actually increased in the carbon monoxide treated animals, either at four hours after or 24 hours after reperfusion or both. Now, Another group actually did something different with the carbon monoxide. Instead of just giving it to the, uh, to the recipient, they just bubbled it into the University of Wisconsin solution. So there's obviously a tremendous attractiveness of doing that because it would be better not to have patients breathe carbon monoxide. So again, here they took a kidney uh, from a pig. They either stored it in plain old UW or in UW that had carbon monoxide bubbled into it. They stored it for 48 hours and then they did the transplant. So what you can see is a similar curve in terms of uh, improvement in BUN and creatinine, but notice here the peak is lower. So there's less injury and there's more rapid recovery from injury. Next, what you can see is that there's less tubular and glomerular injury. There's less tubular dilatation, less inflammatory infiltrates, which are the blue. And I'm not sure how well this is projecting, but the arrows are pointing to blue areas of inflammatory infiltrates, less glomerular sclerosis, and less dilatation of Bowman's capsule. In addition, they found, looking out to day 14 after transplantation, that there was actually less fibrosis, less TGF beta expression in the kidneys, less of the blue um, in the trichrome stain, which is consistent with the fibrosis, and also less uh, um, lower expression, um, excuse me, lower binding of anti smooth muscle antibodies. So that's the carbon monoxide story. Seems to work in pigs, either whether by giving it, delivering it through inhalation to the pig, or whether by bubbling it into the University of Wisconsin storage solution. The next um, agent that we've been testing, which is an ongoing trial, is a silencing RNA against P53. As Rio described, P53 is a molecule considered to be the guardian of the genome, but is also involved in cell death, predominantly through a GDP depletion apoptosis. And so again, this is an early phase study, safety, PK, and clinical activity. So what kind of models suggest that this might work? Rat warm ischemia, where you just clamp off the renal pedicles. This is not a transplant model, and there's no cold ischemia, which is characteristic also of the transplant setting. What happened to these rats? Well, when you give them 15 MP or also QPI, 1002, whatever this thing's called. Um, it's very interesting. Silencing RNA basically trashes the RNA that's being produced for a particular gene and therefore blocks the expression of the protein. And so silencing RNA typically goes into the liver in a first pass sort of uh, metabolism uh, process. But very interestingly, this RNA goes to the kidney. And that's where we wanted to go for renal perfusion. So pre-perfusion, you see nothing. Immediately after infusion, you see some red, which is in the uh, capillaries of the kidney. 
one second after infusion, you can see that the siRNA, the red material, is filtered into Bowman's space. And 10 seconds after the infusion, you can see that the siRNA has drained into the proximal tubule and is actually being actively taken in by the proximal tubular cells. Now, those are the cells that are very susceptible to ischemia reperfusion injury. These, this is why we call it acute tubular necrosis, right? So this is the view of these cells. What you can see is that the um, tubular cells take it up and it's in the luminal surface initially, and then it goes to the intracellular spaces, and by 24 hours after the infusion, it's completely gone. And so I think it's not so damaging or dangerous to give you a P53 blocking agent for a day. You're probably not gonna blossom with a bazillion cancers. Now, this is the evidence that we think that this P53 uh, silencing RNA can block apoptosis. So here's sham treatment, and there's uh, negative control and positive control. So the positive control for apoptosis is this yellow staining. And here's the experimental data where you can see that without treatment on the left panel, there's a lot of apoptotic yellow cells. Whereas with the agent, there's very few apoptotic tubular cells. And so what is the more functional histological data? Well, what you can see in the top panel again is that four doses of the silencing RNA deliver two hours, half an hour before, as well as two hours and eight hours after injury, improved histology and also improved serum creatinine. They had a negative control silencing RNA without P53 specificity, the third bar, which has no effect, and the P53 specific silencing RNA, the fourth bar, had this reduced serum creatinine. But as Rio pointed out, it's not very helpful to give minus uh, drugs at minus two before the injury. So then they took a look and saw, well, can we give it after the injury? And can we just give one dose? So the yellow bar is um, four injections, whereas the blue bars all represent a single injection. And what you can see is giving it at four hours after the injury actually had a substantial effect. Now remember, this is just a clamping model. There isn't transplantation. But if you could clamp and then give it four hours after you clamp, you can still have a good effect on the serum creatinine. So then what they did is they did a dose response and they found what you saw here. They decided that three milligrams uh, was the least effective dose, but you could have better effects if you gave more. And then finally, they actually moved to a transplant model. There were two transplant models, one where you just took the kidney out, didn't preserve it in cold, but it took 45 minutes to get it reconnected. The second model, you have five hours of cold time plus the 45 minutes of warm time. And what did they show? In the first transplant model, and again, what the various bars are, the red bar is the control, the y-axis is the serum creatinine, what you can see is they gave doses either 15 minutes before or four hours after reperfusion, or both. So in the warm ischemia model, the best effect was observed when you both gave it before and after reperfusion. However, in the cold ischemia model, which better mimics the transplant situation, they actually got the best effect when given 15 minutes after reperfusion. So in the clinical trial that we're currently doing, we're giving a dose of this silencing RNA 15 minutes after reperfusion in order to try to achieve this effect. So the real question I have to put out to you is, are humans rats and pigs? So I would argue that they aren't because the donors that are being used for these studies are just normal Joe Schmo pigs and rats, and they tend to be pretty young ones at that. Their age, they don't die of any brain death. 
they don't have comorbidities, and they don't suffer, you know, acute kidney injury related to the brain death. Yes, there is this ischemia, but they don't go through brain death and all the shenanigans that that incurs. The recipients of these transplants are not the kind of people we deal with, are they? So I think this is some of the problem with the models. And what happens is that they are testing a certain set of conditions which correspond to a certain quote unquote amount of injury. And if they find an effect, well, will it work if the injury is more severe? Because we have a whole range of injury. We have some kidneys that get a little injury that are very vulnerable. We have not very vulnerable kidneys who get a lot of injury. We have vulnerable kidneys. That get, we have all kinds of flavors. And these kinds of studies are very unidimensional. One set of circumstances repeated over and over again, and this just isn't what we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. So again, the models fall short, I think, in this ischemia mimicking. You know, what is 48 hours for a pick kidney? Is it equivalent to human? It's hard to know. There's also size mismatch issues that John Roberts alluded to that are not addressed in these studies. And also, there's nothing that relates to immunologic issues that we face. So I think one study, um, the Dianexin study, which Rio alluded to, is getting us a little bit closer because there's actually some human data that is the backbone of the trial that Flavio is starting to do. But this is um, a phase two, three, safety, efficacy, as well as pharmacokinetics of a single dose of this Dianexin molecule. Dianexin is thought to be both antithrombotic as well as anti-inflammatory. And so what is the human data behind this trial? Well, first of all, the red graph shows you the highest dose administered compared to the blue graph, the medium dose, and the black graph, which is no drug administration. And the y-axis is the percent of subjects suffering delayed graft function, and the x-axis is when did they get it. So you can see that the patients who got the highest dose were actually had less DGF, 33%, and it developed it later. There's a rightward shift of the graft, of the graft. However, this is a study with a tremendous amount of DGF. These are 56% DGF because these are marginal kidneys. As you heard from John and Steve, our DGF rate at UCSF is about 30%. So this is this issue of the impact of the severity of the injury. This was a marginal kidney population, and therefore, it's more hopeful that it might work for the kidneys who are suffering DGF that we see clinically. Now, there was no impact on short-term renal function, as you can see in the upper left graph, relative to the placebo versus the two treatment groups. But interestingly, 12 months after transplant, there was an impact on estimated GFR. So this is a little odd, I must say. You know, if you're doing something very early on, you know, is it believable, is it real? Will it pan out that you find an endpoint 12 months later? When rejection, no rejection, you know, 16 other things at the least. Those six month biopsies, inflammation, DSA, you know, lots of stuff has developed. So I think that this is a very intriguing finding and I look forward to figuring out what this is all about and whether it happens again. One other marker that they looked at and, and have some data about is urinary markers of tubular injury. And they again show what's really nice is a graded impact of the placebo versus the low dose versus the high dose in terms of early uh, levels of IP10, which is uh, a biomarker in the urine. So let's briefly talk about endpoints. Um, I'm just gonna give you the big broad view. As you can sense, there are different potential endpoints. There's dialysis parameters, the yes, no, when did it start, how long did it last, many, many flavors of dialysis parameters. There are also renal function parameters, as well as the possibility of biomarkers. And I think the Dianexin uh, trial brings up, should we be looking just in the short term? Should we really extend it into the, at least the medium term, if not the long term. 
So there was a meta-analysis performed of DGF definitions. Frankly, it's hard for us to study something when we don't even know what it is and we don't have a definition. You know, it's hard, it, you know, is DGF like pornography? You know, nobody can really define it, but you kind of know it when you see it. But that's not going to fly for the FDA and it's not going to work for clinical trials. So this um, group combed through almost a thousand citations and found a bunch which tried to define DGF. So what did they find? Well, there were seven definitions based on just dialysis parameters. Was it needed in the first week? Was it needed in the first 10 days? You know, blah, blah, blah. And those are the patients which were studied according to those definitions. Okay, so 41 trials used um, affecting 260,000 patients said need for dialysis the first week after transplant is the definition of DGF used. There were five definitions based on creatinine and creatinine clearance. And then there's another six definitions based on some combination of parameters. So the literature has 18 definitions of DGF. Good luck. So what are the primary issues with these definitions? Why are there 18? Are we so you know, silly that we can't come to an agreement? Because there's just problems everywhere. That's why we can't come to an agreement. Dialysis requirement, it's all subjective. It's based on who the recipient is. You know, you're going to dialyze somebody differently if they're 20 versus 70. There's how much residual renal function and native urine volume. Did they get admitted as they were driving their way to their dialysis unit and we turned them around? Or did they get dialyzed and then come into our unit to get the transplant? And then there's also little silly indications like this acute hyperkalemia, even if the kidney's working, but you want to do it because, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty high potassium. Urine volumes are obviously very, very difficult. And then creatinine-based definitions are also very challenging, particularly because transplant patients are not in steady state, and everybody has a different baseline of creatinine. So a baseline, a creatinine of five for me today well, maybe my creatinine was 10 yesterday, but maybe it was only 5.5 yesterday. And maybe my maximum creatinine is 10, but somebody else's maximum creatinine is 20. So it's very difficult. And as a general comment, things that delay the diagnosis will also compromise our ability to administer therapeutics. And none of these definitions differentiate why the kidney is not working. So first, we need a definition that the kidney the transplanted kidney is not working, then we need a definition that says it's not working because it's just not working, not because there's rejection, there's recurrent disease, or 16 other things going on. So biomarkers, they might give us pathways, mechanisms, but if you don't have a gold standard, how do we figure out what's the best biomarker? And should it be urine, serum, or tissue base, you know, we can't be poking people, so we have to hopefully look in the urine. And currently, these are all investigational because we can't use them for clinical trials. And so this is the real, you know, kind of dilemma. We need a unifying definition, but that definition has to have specificity. So finally, I'm just going to spend you know, one second going through the study recently that's been mentioned by a couple of people questioning the, you know, we're almost getting to the so what. Yes, DGF is a, is a huge pain. They stay in the hospital. They get ultrasounds. They get biopsies. We have to follow them very closely. Is the kidney working? Is it time to stop the dialysis? But fundamentally, if I could promise you that a one-year post-transplant, whether you had DGF or not, your kidney function was perfect, and at 10 years post-transplant, it didn't make a difference, would we care? So let's look at what is the evidence of DGF. This same group did a meta-analysis in 2008, and they said, yep, DGF is bad. Increased risk of breath loss, a lot of studies shifted to the right. Yep, it's bad increased risk of rejection. So why would we even begin to think that DGF doesn't matter for longer-term outcomes? Well, if you look at these studies, when were they published? 
1996, 1999, 19... Thank God we don't do things the way we did them back then. We have thymoglobulin, we have induction with basiliximab, we have all kinds of fancy new toys that have reduced the risk of rejection. There's many papers that show that the immunologic impact is much less these days and that we're really limited by the quality of the kidneys that we're transplanting. And so a more recent analysis published in 2011 did it in a very elegant way using paired kidneys. So every donor hopefully donates two kidneys and they only looked at the transplants where one kidney had DGF and the other kidney didn't. So that way, when you compare those two, the donor issues are all gone. So what you can really focus on is warm, uh, cold ischemia time, DGF, and recipient issues. You can't get rid of the recipient factors. So what they showed was, as you would expect, if you look at the paired kidneys, the light bars are the ones with the longer cold time, and the dark bars are the ones with the co le lower cold times. If the difference in cold ischemia time was five hours, you can see the, the second set of bars, there was a difference in the frequency of DGF that increased as the difference in the kidneys in cold ischemia time increased. And what did they show? There was no difference in overall graft loss between these paired kidneys. There was no difference in death sensor graft loss. And the only difference they, they found is if you got the kidney with 15 or more hours of cold time, you had an increased risk of dying. Now that suggests that it's the recipient selection potentially that drove that, because there's some reason why this was 15 hours longer of cold time, but it's impossible to tease that out. And finally, I really agree with Rio. I think it's really important to start ratcheting the clock back. The injury is starting in the donor. And then it's just, you know, it's um, exacerbated by the reperfusion aspect. So we have to think about doing donor trials. You know, there's a lot of attempts at donor management. Let's tweak the vent. Klaus and Rio are doing something very innovative, hypothermia, glucose management. But what if we wanted to try to find that magic bullet and give the donor a magic bullet? Could we do that? And I would say we can't do it. And these are the logistical and ethical issues that I want to bring out. At the OPO level, some OPOs don't even have an algorithm to consider a research protocol. And what if the thoracic team doesn't want to give it to the donor while the abdominal team does or vice versa? Who's going to adjudicate this and are we going to require consensus? You know, we can't agree on DGF. Are we going to be able to agree on what is whether we want to give an investigational drug to a donor who could give seven organs? Donor families we would probably need to get at least authorization and or consent. Do we have to tell them in the midst of their you know, um, tragedy, the gory details of the science, and, or you know, what are our obligations to donor families? Donor hospitals, well, brain dead donors are dead. They don't actually fit human subject definition. But there's a lot of backlash that can happen if donor, you know, experimentation on dead people, you know, is out there and, you know, bandied about in a callous, inappropriate way. And it's very hard because every hospital in the entire United States is a donor hospital. So how do we get donor hospitals on board to be a part of or allow this research to occur? What about the recipient side? Every person on the list might get that kidney if it's a zero mismatch. How do we deal with consenting the recipient, the transplant surgeon, physician, and the center? And then finally, the transplant community. Might something bad, if we give something that boxes a bunch of organs, have an impact on organ donation, an impact on organ allocation and distribution? And finally, an impact on Who's going to monitor if I'm doing a kidney DGF study? Well, maybe something bad is happening with the liver or the lungs. 
Somebody is going to need to monitor that. So I think this is just a, an outline of some of the challenges that we're trying to work on through the professional societies to try to develop an algorithm that's going to help us get donor studies done. So I'm not going to even have a summary slide because I'm sure I'm over time, um, but I wanted just to give you a lay of the land in terms of clinical trials for DGF. Thank you.